I think a big part of my identification is I, I want to give back to the community because I post a lot of observations as well and I get a lot of people coming on and identifying my observations. So I kind of want to pay that back um, because so many people have been so kind uh, and generous with their time and their expertise. And iNaturalist has, has literally changed my life without exaggeration. Just the amount of knowledge that I have gained over the past few years compared to before I used iNaturalist uh, has just been incredible. Like the amount of things that I've learned from all the people that I, I've managed to be lucky enough to interact with. So I've, I've always really wanted to uh, pay, pay that back. My name is uh, Thomas Mazzaglio and on INET I am the beachcomber. I've lived in Sydney, Australia for my whole life. So my grandparents moved up to a little town called North Haven, 360, 370 kilometres north of Sydney. Uh, a little quiet coastal town and that was in the 90s so I pretty much spent every school holidays going up with my family visiting them before really the era of iPads and iPhones and all that kind of tech that kids get pretty early on uh, nowadays so I just spent pretty much my whole time going out in the bush and particularly beachcombing uh, on this beach called North Haven Beach big three and a half kilometer long uh, open ocean beach and I just spent hundreds, thousands of hours uh, beachcombing that beach as a kid and just finding all kinds of amazing shells and sea snakes and jellyfish and all the kind of cool stuff that as a kid really acts as that hook to get you interested in science because you, I find especially beaches tend to be a really great thing to engage young people with because you just don't know what could wash up. There's so many different things that you can find and it really, even in beach, even in a beach that I have gone on for hundreds and thousands of hours, I'm still finding new stuff washing up and I think that really adds to the appeal. It's just this uh, constant process of discovery uh, every time you go there. So I decided that I might put together all the thousands of photos I've taken and all the kind of knowledge I'd accumulated of the area over the years and I'm about four years of actual proper collecting of shells and then photographing and writing and ended up last year putting out a field guide uh, that I self-published, uh, Seashells of North Haven Beach. So it's a designed to be a comprehensive guide of every single seashell that I've ever found on the beach with information on where to find them, how common they are, photos, uh, but probably 95% or more of the species that are in the book you can find pretty much along the whole New South Wales coast. So it is more broadly applicable as a field guide, but that, that wasn't really my main aim. I kind of mostly wrote it to try and ignite that passion in other people and act as that kind of tool for a young person picks it up, sees all the really cool shells, and then maybe that acts as one of those sparks for them to get really interested in the natural world. And if there's at least a few people for which that happens, I think that is a big win for me to get those people interested in science. I was doing a six month internship at the Australian Museum in Sydney in the entomology department, but I kind of took that opportunity. I'd Got a lot of photos on my phone and I didn't have that much knowledge of species like I I knew what all the common stuff was but I really wasn't good at identifying back then and so I was taking the opportunity to go around to all the other departments in my lunch times harass all the curators and ask them for IDs and I happened to go to the Fishers department uh, and the curator uh, there at the time was uh, Mark McGruther who was uh, Mark McGee on iNaturalist and he said, have you heard of this project that I started called Australasian Fishers? And he said, it's just this amazing community of pretty much every major fish curator and taxonomist and expert in the whole country. And he said, if you post it there, you'll be able to get it ID'd. So I joined Australasian Fishers that night, posted about 25 dead fish uh, that I'd found on the beach. And pretty much my first 200 observations were just dead fish that I'd found on the beach, all kinds of interesting things that had washed up. And, Kind of slowly over time I realized oh, there's, there's actually a bit more to this platform than just just this Fishers project. Started to realize I could post other things and then after maybe six months or so realize uh, you know, I've, I've had a lot of IDs given to me and a lot of people have really helped me out so I should start to give back to the community and then I started identifying as well and yeah things just really took off from there. So I, I owe a huge debt of gratitude uh, to Mark um, for introducing me to iNaturalist.
I wrote it with another guy, uh, Corey Callahan. Um, on INAT is Corey T. Callahan. Uh, really, really amazing guy, huge citizen science expert, uh, has a massive amount of papers uh, on citizen science, both using citizen science data, but also a lot of uh, like theoretical papers per se, like how to improve the collection of records and how we can um, produce better data. And we've written probably five or six uh, papers together relating to INAT data. And we're kind of constantly just sending emails and bouncing ideas off each other. And we kind of both were coming up with this idea where we thought it seems to be a real deficit of identifiers on iNaturalist if you compare that to the observers. So it's, it, I think the stat from January of this year was something like 92% of people who have ever uh, used iNaturalist have only ever uploaded an observation. So you obviously have this massive long tail distribution and obviously you've got a lot of identifiers for things like birds and fishes and a lot of the more charismatic groups, but when it comes to some esoteric groups of invertebrates and plants, uh, sometimes for some areas of the world, there's literally no one, there's no experts. And so you've just got this big bank of potentially really, really valuable data and observations that might just be sitting there with an observation of plant or spider. That might be some really cool thing but there just doesn't have those expert eyes looking at it. So we thought, what if we write this essentially call to arms uh, to try and get more experts to join our naturalist uh, as identifiers? But we, we wanted it to be uh, very inclusive. So we kind of defined an expert, not necessarily just someone in a professional role, like a taxonomist or someone for which identification and this kind of thing is their actual day job, but just anyone who has that knowledge. So this includes uh, a lot of indigenous uh, people who just have this amazing local knowledge of their area um, across all regions of the world. A lot of these uh, amateur naturalists as well that have been studying beetles for like 50 years and don't have any actual formal qualifications, but just know their group so unbelievably well. So we wanted to recruit both those people and the professional uh, taxonomists and botanists and entomologists. We wanted to present it, frame it in a way that the experts are also getting something out of the process. So it's that two-way exchange. So it's not just getting the identifiers to come and just completely dedicate their time. A lot of them are really busy already, of course. Uh, so we wanted to frame it in a way that they're offering their expertise and their knowledge and their time, but then also iNaturalist is able to give back to them as well, which uh, we thought was a, a really useful way to frame things. It was a very short piece, so it wasn't one of the longer research articles you would typically get in a scientific journal. More of one of those uh, letter style pieces, one of those conversation style pieces that are designed to spark interest. So started off with a very general introduction, even stepping back from iNaturalist, just a general citizen science perspective, saying over the last five to ten years, citizen science has just experienced this explosive growth uh, in kind of every metric you can imagine, number of users, uh, number of observations, number of species, just accelerating unbelievably. Uh, and initially there were some misgivings about citizen science data, especially biodiversity citizen science, things like identification, reliability, um, spatial uh, accuracy, and, and a lot of concerns that people had over the quality of the data. But not only has that quality greatly improved over time, but there are now many, many useful analytical techniques and, and ways that you can manipulate the statistics that uh, go way over my head, but a lot of really cool methods now that can account for and correct for, those, for that data quality uh, issue, especially when you combine professional data sets with the citizen science data sets. Then segueing into iNaturalist being one of, if not the premier, at least in terms of number of users and number of observations, citizen science platforms in the world from a biodiversity perspective and how it just has this uh, tremendous amount of data uh, and a lot of huge value, but then presenting that problem. We have this real deficit of identifiers and that gap is probably only increasing. So we're getting more and more observers joining the site, producing unprecedented amounts of data, uh, but that the recruitment of experts is not matching the rate of the recruitment of observers and the amount of observations that are getting added to the site. And then we presented essentially uh, seven reasons. So that was kind of the, the shtick of the paper, was that we had these seven main reasons why you should contribute to iNaturalist as an identifier in the sense of what the platform will give back to you if you are able to dedicate your time and your expertise. I can go out, I can take a photo of some really interesting bug, upload it to iNaturalist, 
and then someone on the other side of the world can literally identify it within the next minute for me. And then if it, becomes, if it ends up becoming research grade, it only takes a week or two to go to GBIF. So immediately you have these records that are not only usable on iNaturalist themselves, if people export the data directly from iNat, but then also go to these external data aggregators literally within a week or two. Um, so it's just really that rapid turnaround that I think is, is quite valuable. We now have a lot of really great statistical techniques that even though these iNaturalist data aren't being collected in a standardized uh, way, there are just so many ways that uh, you, can, you can manipulate the data and use the data now, thanks to these advances in statistical technology, that these opportunistic data points actually do become uh, really valuable. They are really great for researchers in particular that are trying to find records where they may not have the time or the money or the resources to go out and survey those species themselves. So iNaturalist is a really great port of call for a lot of these um, data deficient species and threatened species because that data collection has, has been done for you, especially in the case of things like uh, range extensions where you get a lot of citizen scientists finding things popping up where the researchers never knew that they existed before. Once you get over that initial hurdle of learning how to use the platform, it's really intuitive and the workflow is really, really fast. So it's, everything is kind of done for you. If you go back maybe 15 years, a lot of these experts would be identifying citizen records through emails. But here on iNaturalist, you know, you've got 30 records sitting on the page all in front of you. And if it's something really easy to identify and recognize, it's literally just a single click of a button on the agree button. And it takes one second to identify something. And then if it's something a bit trickier, you just click on the window, you go to pop up, you can see the photos, you can see the map, you can see the date. It's all there in front of you. And it's all just streamlined to allow you to go through and identify things as fast as possible and make things as easy as possible. It's just this completely globalized platform where I've had essentially real-time discussions on an observation with people from three or four different continents, all chiming in at the same time, all different time zones, uh, and able to have this, this real-time discussion about the identification of something, which I just think is absolutely incredible. Uh, and it just makes the experts, from a citizen scientist perspective, it just makes the experts so much more approachable. It's really sparked a lot of external collaborations just by accidentally bumping into other experts and identifiers on our naturalist. So this is kind of like reason five, but more so the uh, education side of things and more so the citizen science the citizen aspect of it, where it gives you that chance to really get your work out there and, and really take on that educational role. I do think that a lot of experts find that a really gratifying experience to have people really interested in your work. You know, you, you might be someone who's worked on this esoteric group of bugs for the past 40 years, and now suddenly you've got this whole community of people who are really, really passionate about the same group of insects that you are, and that gets you really excited as an expert as well, that other people are interested in, in that same really niche thing that you are. Many experts, they are just generally passionate naturalists. And that's why many people get into the taxonomy and, and ecology business because they're really passionate about the natural world. And iNaturalist just offers this opportunity to really live uh, vicariously through other naturalists from around the world. You can be sitting in an apartment block in the most urbanized city in the world, and you can go through and look at observations from uh, deep sea Antarctica, from the remote jungles in the Amazon, the outback of Australia. Uh, and you just get to experience all these amazing species from around the world that you may never have the opportunity to actually see yourself. Then just really brings a, a smile to your face.